Welcome to Wellness Radio with Dr. Jeanette Gallagher as your host. Her show discusses topics of health, wellness, and spirituality and is about discovering your place in this great universe from your cells to the cosmos. Along with her guest in casual conversation, she strives to ask the difficult questions that may be holding you back from a vibrant life and shares new ideas that may inspire you to make a change in your life that you only can see in your dreams. And now, here is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Radio. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. What we're going to be talking about is what is the facade, the drag, the cloak, the outside human being, that which we are personifying as I am. What are we talking about? Are we talking about I am a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a white, a black, an Asian, a Mexican, tall, big, short, thin, fat? Are we talking about the names, the labels that humans have given to each other? I've spoken many times over the past 13 years on this radio show about words to kick to the curb. And those are judgment words. Words that keep us in separation. Words that put something in between us that says, I see you as. And then perhaps we step back and say, ah, that's my judgment. That's my perception. That is an experience that I have had in the past. Or perhaps it's a filter in which I'm seeing you through. And it's very unfair these days, as we always talk about the spiritual path, the awakening, the expanded consciousness, and the soul journey, that we are yet still stuck with some of these human words. Kick them to the curb, so to speak. It's about being able to say, I see you, I hear you, and I'm here for you. That's it. As I've just posted, I think it was recently on social media, I said, life is breath. Everything else is lane nap. And lane nap here in the New Orleans area means everything else is a gift. So if we say life is breath, everything else is a gift. Can we look at the world around us, our reality, our experiences in this life story as just that? Perhaps that's where we are going. Maybe you're not there yet, and still others are saying, I have no clue what you're talking about. What we're saying is open up. Say, tell me something new. Expand my horizons. Let me step off the edge. You know, and I think sometimes we get so stuck in saying, but, but, that's another word to kick to the curb. Today my guest is R.G. Shore. His book is The Ocean Inside of Me. A spiritual memoir on healing racial trauma. RJ, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. I really appreciate you having me on your show. I, I'm, uh, I'm honored to, to be a part of your your journey. I'm so glad to have you, RJ, because I think your story, we have shared so much over the decade, but I also think that uh, it's continuing, it's more timely to people who are now opening up an awareness do you think perhaps that when you wrote this book, you may have said, you know what, I just need to tell my story so I can validate the process that I went through? It's a good question. I mean, I think, um, you know, my story is, the ocean inside me is all about, uh, you know, my time sort of incarcerated as a person of color in an almost all-white prison in the PNW, and, and I decided to go into my body and 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 heal, the address the trauma and heal the wounds through spiritual modalities like uh, meditation. And so I, I knew that when I got out that my journey wasn't just my journey, but everyone's journey. And so mm-hmm. I think before I wrote the book, I knew that this wasn't just about me looking for uh, a way to process, but I knew that it was it was going to be a more impactful story that, that a lot of people needed to hear. So I think I was aware that the <laughs> that the divine was sort mm-hmm. of saying, I've, I've I've got something through this that I'm going to share share through yeah. you. So. 
I think also, too, the idea is that we look at other people through their perception. You know, immediately when you say prison, immediately when you say color, immediately when you say, you know, you have a judgment of doing something wrong or being less than, all of those things are human filters, you know, that we put upon the engagement between two people. Do you think you actually have felt that and perhaps worn the badge of that? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, especially in the U.S., I mean, the incarceration rates are, you know, double, sometimes triple the next the next highest incarceration rate. And the recidivism rate, meaning the, the likelihood of someone coming back to prison in the U.S., is is like 10 times greater than a lot of other countries. And I think the, the, the reasoning behind that is because we are, a, we are a capitalistic country and we're a country that tries to make money off of anything. And, and people somewhere in the prison industry are making a lot of money. And, and, and coupled with that, there's an idea of a punitive society, right? We want, we don't want people to heal as much as we want people to be punished. And I think right. as much as people say, no, 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 we want rehabilitation. We want healing. Well, when the rubber meets the road, that actually isn't the case. Uh, and so in my experience, I witnessed firsthand the reality is that, no, people don't want you to heal because when you heal, it takes away the narrative of a good guy and a bad guy. But we all know in the spiritual healing world, there's only good guys, right? Like it's, yeah. there's only winners, but that's not that's not a story that sells. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you know, there's a, in the spiritual community, there's been this growing like, flux, so to speak, in the last, I'd say maybe five or six years, and they were like, oh, I'm I'm spiritual, uh, you know, and I almost, I get this, since I'm a medium, I got this vision, you're in a white cloak with your Birkenstocks on, rising above other people, and just going about your business and enjoying yourself, and in separation of the world around you, you know, and even someone had said to me at one time, well, I see them, you know, but I kind of like, I send them some prayers or I send them some light. And I'm going like, don't send me your light in your prayers, you know. That's that's very um, that's very not good, you know, so to speak. Because I think the idea is that that further provokes the idea of separation of the good and the bad again. Yet people don't even realize that that's what they're doing. They're saying, oh, put up your boundaries, put up your barriers. You know, I go mm-hmm. through life... I get hit with everything, you know. Um, I I see ghosts and all that. In fact, the other night they, there was a ghost in here, and it was like, oh, okay. So I kind of got hit with the darkness that day. The next day it was something else. Or the next day was talking to someone, and they couldn't stop lashing out. Another day someone was asking, you know, about how to help them and, and assist them. I think what you truly have come to a place of, is accepting all of these aspects of your reality versus saying you're better than or like and putting yourself on a pedestal than those others because that really is not in the deepest heart of an unconditional love person. That's really still conditional, correct? I mean, you know, I I think what's tough in in the both and world and in the world that I'm that I'm in is is not just uh, accepting my oppressors as my very self, which is a lot about mm-hmm. what the ocean inside me is about. Is learn it. What does it mean to see the white supremacist sitting across me as my very self? But I found that that you know you talk about these um, you mentioned these sort of like pseudo spiritualists who right. you envision wearing white bir- or w- white cloak and Birkenstock. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the the message in- includes them as well, right? So it's it's a level of being like. As much as they are still living in a dualistic world, they are mm-hmm. they are part of the non dualistic world that that we're talking about. And so, to me, it's a it's a transcend and include model. Meaning, like mm-hmm. you you look at people who are maybe operating in a different level of consciousness or a different frequency, and say somehow that frequency is also a part of this much larger journey. And so, it's not about telling them that they're wrong, because otherwise, I've dropped down into the same dualistic mm-hmm. frequency that they're in. So right. so it's, it's a, a transcendent include all people um, because that's really the only way to, to truly heal, I think. Right. RJ, let's talk about in the beginning of your journey when you talked about meditation and you said about putting on the headphones. And um, when you talked about the static, and I liken it to you have turned the dial 
to a different frequency, but that frequency has yet to consolidate, has yet to conform. It's almost as if it's waiting and holding, and I call it the abyss. Do you think perhaps that what you've done is, when you put on the earphones, is shut out the old frequency to try to turn into the new and teleporting yourself out to be able to find where you want to be? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good sort of uh, perspective on it. I mean, the reality at the time was I was, you know, stuck in a place surrounded Mm -hmm. by people who don't know how to sit still, right? And so when you're trying to find stillness in a place of no stillness, it's, it mm-hmm. feels like an impossibility. So so at the time it was how do I heal and address my wounds by going inward when there's just nonstop movement around me. And so buying the buying the sort of prison radio and headphones was just at first and at the at the surface level a way to sort of drown out the noise. Um right. and it clearly on a meditative level, the white noise I, you know, knew from previous experiences and meditation and um, is that like the white noise helps to create sort of a a relaxed frequency of of neither here nor there, right? You're in that kind of liminal space. And so I think on the surface level, that's what I was doing was creating a realm where I could, I could address those yes. wounds. But yes, I think on a metaphorical and spiritual level, uh, there, there was a, okay, I'm ready to do the healing. And quite literally, I'm, I'm tracing the, the frequency of the dial. Um, right. And, and again, I, I think uh, I think often the way that the universe shows up is uh, the universe is like, I'm never not here. I'm just kind of waiting for you to, uh, to to change to change the frequency. I'm. It's not that you have to do something different or you have to whatever respond. It's it's the universe again. Again, I think is always present. It's us that needs to sort of shift our perspective mm-hmm. or shift our vibrational level to to be able to meet the universes. You know, what you wrote in your book, again, um, there's no real kindness in here, you said, and you, um, to be lonely with myself, which can often feel more painful. And, you know, I think it's so important. On a soul and spiritual journey, you come to the point where things start to fall apart. <laughs> your whole world dissolves. Maybe yours just did where you were in that physical location. But many others have it happen in different things. You know, I've been in healthcare for over five decades, and I can tell you exactly. I can pinpoint them when they walk in the door. Or others who have just had some breakdowns and everything around them collapses. Mm-hmm. But even so, that was meant to be so you can sit in silence of yourself and be able to hear a different tone, a different place in time, and sense something differently. So when you think about it, um, when you were in jail, that was really, you took away a lot of your outside stuff, and it kind of got stripped away from you. But many times people will say, oh, but I need to have those people around me. But a spiritual journey is about not tethering to anything within the physical dimension or the physical density. That would be like, oh, I have to keep, you know, people say, I don't have any money, but they've got a house and a car, you know, or they turn around, they say, but yo, I just don't know how I'm going to be able to meet my bills, but they've got a job, you know, and I think sometimes we say, I have to have that, but in the way they're saying I've got to have more because there's this hole inside of me where it's lonely or it's left apart or whatever. And in essence, the soul journey says, forget it. I'm ta- like an octopus. I'm kind of like taking all of your tentacles away. And now tell me that the tentacles are important to be the head, the source energy. You really had to come back to draw your tentacles back in and say, I am the source energy, correct? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think that the, um, I think that, you know, if you want to use a particular like religious example, I think, uh, you know, there's an idea that we all have a cross to bear, but that cross is going to be different for each individual person, mm-hmm. right? We all have a particular wound that, that leads to light. And so whether it's a car crash, prison, war, or even just the dentist, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's kind of up to the universe to sort of say, what is your cross or what is your wound that needs to be met and understood? Um, and so, yeah, it's going to it's going to definitely look different for everybody. I mean, I right. think as far as 
stripping away the materials, I I don't I don't like to think that it's always going to be the same for everyone. So for some people mm-hmm. who need those materials taken away, then yeah, that's going to happen. But I don't think the universe is as black and white. I think some people uh, have never necessarily had those materials. And so the universe says, I'm going to uh, take this non-material thing away, this this ego or this whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I think the the addressing your wound comes comes in different ways but often what i tell clients now cuz i'm a spiritual i'm a spiritual counselor now and uh we have a nonprofit that that i founded and so i'm working with clients all the time in this regard and one of the things i often tell clients is if you want to go into the desert you can't take the village with you if you take any mm-hmm. part of the village with you you haven't actually entered the desert you've just relocated right. the village so so the reality is is if you're willing to go on this journey, you have to mm-hmm. let go of all the things you think you that you think will get you there and also you think you know. So there's a mm-hmm. level of really fully letting go and surrendering, even to the things you thought were certain. Um and so yes, I think the the greatest the greatest uh sort of key to the spiritual awakening that that people are looking for is surrendering uh, and surrendering the life that you thought you were supposed to live. And I think one of the things I wrote in my book, um, I think it was early on, I wrote that, uh, you know, uh, I think that you have to fail at the one thing you thought you were born to do. Um, And Mm -hmm. that, that, that idea of, of breaking down preconceived notions, breaking down, well, I thought I was this thing. And then the universe comes in and says, Nope, you're much more. So, so okay. surrender that small thing and 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 open to a much larger a much larger um, a much larger shift that that's happening for you. You shared in your book. You talked about exhaling the ego, and I wrote on the top of the page, "Release ba- badges." I've shared on the show before that truly, your soul is about a bag of glitter inside of you. That is your essence, your spirit your soul being and we are are born into this world and kind of like we jump into this costume and it's called the human body and then everything that comes at us is like uh i almost like in the human body to be like a sweatsuit you know and everything starts to stick on you like a badge you know and you know like i went to school i did this i someone said this whatever it is it can be all forms of what you engage in and interact in. And then you think about the glitter inside and you say, I'm looking to see outside of this wetsuit that I'm in with these badges on. And you've got to look through all of these badges to use as filters to see the next person. So that's how you always use your experiences to shadow and overshadow the way in which you perceive that on the other side of you. Many times people will do that. And that really has a lot to do with ego, too, because you say, I went to school and you got this big, big badge on your chest, you know, or I did this and I did that and blah, blah, blah. And once those start to pop off, you truly are left with, okay, what now? And when you look out at people... You come up with the words, I am, and you don't have another word to say after it. I know I've done that for decades, you know. I can't tell you how many times my web person says, write up your bio, and I'm like, I don't know what to write, (laughs) you know. Because when you have the I am, you're really truly allowing yourself and your energetic self to engage with another being. Have you found that? Yeah, I mean, I think in the ocean inside me, you know, I I think chapter three and exhaling the ego. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think one of the things I liken it to is, um, you know, um, I, I you know it's Thomas Merton once famously wrote like it's it's like climbing a ladder and you reach the top only to discover that the ladder is leaning up against the wrong wall. And mm-hmm. one of the things I say is that that in the spiritual world or the spiritual journey, the ladder is not vertical it's not up and down but it's horizontal it's side to side and and I, and I think one of the things that has to be let go is understanding that these are all just rungs on a ladder and not any rung sort of determines or discerns what the ladder actually is the ladder is made of wood or it's made of metal it's not 
it, you know, the rungs themselves are not the elements. They are just parts of them. And so I think, I think there's a, there's a place where we understand that, yeah, like I'm this thing, I'm this thing, I'm this thing, I'm this thing. And, and spirituality, when you sort of go into that falling upward movement of, of falling into God or falling into the divine, you realize that it, never been about doing but about being and right. and when you start to realize it's about being and not about doing then you have less of a desire to say well i'm doing this and i'm doing this and i'm doing this and i'm yeah. doing this because those don't those, those things have never defined you and so mm-hmm. i i think again it's if anyone's kind of willing to go on the journey and willing to sort of say what does it mean to define myself you you have to shift from a doing to a being right this. Yeah, that's when you truly have no badges left, you know what I mean? In other words, you couldn't yeah. find one if your life depended on it, you know, sometimes. And you don't need to. You know, right. I, I think that's right. the reality is, is there's less of a desire to because you realize badges are never necessarily for you. They're for mm-hmm. other people. Um, right. And, and and again, people's perspective of of you as a reflection of themselves, not of you, just as your reflection of God or universe is not – a reflection of God, but a reflection of you. And so I think, again, letting go of these, you call them badges, and I think just the reality of what they are is just uh, attachments, right? You are, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you have all these different attachments uh, from based upon your life experiences. And the divine, when you're ready, the divine comes and says, okay, let's, let's let go of this narrative so that we can shift into a much larger narrative that, that actually exists uh, and actually stems from probably before your birth and after your death. Um, So just let go of the small self and accept the much larger self that you're actually supposed to embody and embrace. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about, um, you know, what you're going to take with you. You can't reposition the community and stuff when you go to the desert. Um, When I work so much with patients at end of life, they are so blocked up with so much and Mm -hmm. they just can't even get themselves to breathe it's almost i guess you can almost correlate the story of death exactly with that and when i think sometimes when we talk we say you know honey what do you what what is it you know what's going on and they'll say well you know i'm going to leave this person and that person and this that and the other i had one um she allowed me to share a story and it was you know, I, I asked her, I said, well, what's, what's the deal? Why are you not letting yourself go or why are you trying to stay here? And she said, we just bought this house. We just bought this car now. And how is someone, my person, going to be able to take care of it and blah, blah, blah? I said, honey, you're not going to be here. You're not going to be here in two weeks. Is this something mm-hmm. that you need to emphasize yourself on today? But she simply could not let the story go to allow herself the grace to go through and go into the desert, and go into the end of life, and be free to be able to do that. She got so stuck in the story. I think sometimes we get stuck in the story, and just as you shared in your book, it says you ha- um, you already belong even before your best, your birth, you have belonged. I think a lot of people, once they start in this process and get knee-deep in it, they say, oh my goodness, now what? And they're looking for validation and safety. Isn't that truly what human or oh, soul beings as humans were really looking for? Tell me that I'm here and tell me I'm safe. Isn't that really core kind of drill it down aspect that we're all seeking? Sure. I mean I think I think at the very yes, I think at the very like basic level, like when mm-hmm. you're born you are needing survival and safety and your basic needs met. And so if those basic needs aren't met, it kind of creates a, a programming within your body and your brain saying, I'm not safe and I need to feel safe. I, I mm-hmm. think for people who do grow in healthier families and are raised with conversations that are healthier and more inclusive and open to allowing you to be who you are, I think it's less of a survival uh, energy to begin with and much more of a, okay, who am I kind of energy? Like, what does it mean to to find the self? And so I think depending upon your circumstances, your life circumstances, where you find yourself. I mean, one of the things I write in the ocean inside me is like, look, if you're out in the desert looking for water, you don't have the energy to ask why your daddy doesn't love you. Mm-hmm. And, and and there's just, there's just a reality to depending upon who you are and where you are, uh, you're either in survival mode or some other kind of mode and you don't have, 
the capacity to ask uh, sort of more uh, like larger philosophical questions of what right. is what does it mean to have an identity? You're just like, hey, I need to find food for today, and and unfortunately, yeah. I think a lot of people are in that sort of survival energy, and of course, the universe meets them there too. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there is an energy that that meets us where we are, and our sort of journey in that is to allow what is, not to push away what isn't, not to push for what isn't. Um, and I think in that beingness and in that presence, you begin to realize, oh, uh, yeah, I was always just the divine, just in this in this form. And my whole purpose was to remember that I'm the divine, uh, you know, and, and and it's it's almost like the divine is playing a game of hide and seek with itself. <laughs> so. Right, right, yep. Yeah. And you also wrote in your book, again, the title of the book is The Ocean Inside Me. You wrote about when you were walking and you saw something and you picked it up, you thought it was a rock, but it was a seed. It was about... Um, maybe 15 years ago on this show, when I had shared that to go to the store, buy a, just buy a bunch, a whole slew of different kinds of seeds, right, in the packets, dump them all in a bowl, cover them all with dirt, mold them all together like mud, and take them and make seed balls and go out in your community and just start throwing all these seed balls out. You know, I was in that point mm-hmm. of, yeah, y'all need to start seeding, you know, something else. Because <laughs> this story is getting old. Take the seed balls and start going out. And then yeah. go back and look and see what's grown. And I think the idea is sometimes people buy seeds and they say, oh, I want to know everything about it, you know. I have to own it, define it, everything. You put a stake in the dirt and you say, this is where my tomato plants are going to grow because the package said it's a tomato, blah, blah, blah. And in essence, if you do the seed ball idea, you have no idea what you've been gifted with. And it's really looking at it in a more expansive, unconscious kind of way. And and it's just so much more beautiful, the, the gift that you're being given. Because one day you might say, oh, there's a tomato over there. Oh, that's a flower. Oh, that's just maybe it's just some grass for the birds or whatever it might be. Instead of always claiming, because when the tomato doesn't show up and you say, I must have done something wrong. I didn't water it. I didn't put it in the sun. You know, and those are two very different pictures within the same concept of a seed. Don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think so. To give context to the listeners, um, you know, again, the ocean inside me, um, you know, my spiritual memoir is like I create my body created these in in this very unsafe environment. Uh, Mm -hmm. My body created a realm where I could go and and do the healing and address the things I need to address. So when Dr. Jeanette is talking about the seed, there's a meditation where I'm walking around the track while in the snow because it's in the winter time and over time this repetition leads me into my body where I'm creating this meditation and all of a sudden I'm on a mountain um and for me this is really happening this isn't like a a, st- a story that I'm like this is really happening to my body where all of a sudden I'm transported on a mountain because uh, my body is creating this visual meditation for me uh and I drop into this sort of hole in a mountain where I'm stuck with just this seed uh, and this seed is essentially uh, going to going to lift me out of the mountain. Uh, but I don't know what it is, and I don't know how long it's going to take. And so I think a part of our relationship as co-creators with the divine is, is okay, look, like it's not like we're just sort of ants waiting to be on a log, waiting to be, you know, like uh, thrown into the water or whatever. Um, I I think the reality is as co-creators, we have some sort of say, but but I think where often people, you know, the best of us, myself included on a daily basis is it's great. You set this intention. You know where you want to go. Now let me help you get there. You don't get to decide how you get there, I think, is a part of part of the way that the universe works. And so, look, you're wanting... To, to rise out of this mountain. You're wanting to do this thing. You're wanting to do this thing. I'm glad that you've done the work to change the frequency. And even with all that work, I'm not letting you, I'm not going to let you decide how to get there because that would take away the entire process of trust. So right. I promise you you're going to get where you want to go, 
because you've aligned yourself, because you've done the work, but I'm not going to show you exactly how you're going to get there. And so this idea of you sort of saying, like, putting a bunch of seeds together and sort of mm-hmm. uh, and throwing them out there and not knowing what you're getting, I think is this idea of, you uh, you know, from my perspective, you're not helpless. You get to choose and create or co-create the life you want and along the way have enough trust that the universe is going to get you there, even if it wasn't the route you thought you, you needed to, to take in order to get there. Right. And also, too, in your book, you shared about when the guards were asking you about, um, they had said, you know, about Buddha and about Muslim. I think that was so vitally important because they were seeing a crack in you. So, in other words, they were able to read something that would make sense to them. In other words, sometimes we can't always present as uh, a certain facade that we want to be. We need to leave cracks so others can be drawn into our space and be able to understand from their perspective. So I think that, you know, just as the siege, you know, you are be able to see something else. He saw something in you that he was curious about. And he was, you, he made, you made him feel safe enough to ask. Yes? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a... Uh, that's a really insightful thing. I think when I wrote that and what I experienced was funny enough, kind of the opposite, which is a, a reflection on, you know, cause you're, you're based out of Louisiana, I believe and or New Orleans, mm-hmm. sorry. And um, specifically, and um, I'm here in the PNW. And one of the greatest differences is that the PNW is significantly white. It's a very, very, very white area of the United States. And mm-hmm. so in being put in an almost all-white prison as a person of color, I think a part of what I was sharing in that was the reflection of many people in prison and many, including many of the guards and employees aren't used to seeing people of color and certainly not, you know, someone from, from India. And so there was a level of continual ignorance, not just among prisoners, but among uh, the employers, which was sort of saying there's a greater ignorance of people being judged by, like you said, badges, whether that's color of right. skin or whatever. So the assumption in that story, that, that that thing that took place was, oh, you're brown, you must be a Muslim, right? Which, Or you must be a Buddhist. I'm neither. Um, and so there is a reality to, hey, how do we treat people based upon what we think about them, based upon just how we see them and our cultural biases, whether we know that that we have them or not. And so I I think it was less about him seeing me and much more about his, um, his particular experience, life experiences had never Mm -hmm. given him any sort of, I mean, because another part of that, that story that I write is he kept saying Buddha like butter, right? Like, and Uh I kept like picturing a a stick of butter because he didn't even know that it was pronounced Buddha, right? He was, he kept saying butter, um, and so there is a level of, and again, I appreciate where you're coming from of, you know, who knows what the universe is doing in that moment. Mm-hmm. But I think in me sharing that particular story that happened to me, it was just a tiny reflection of the injustice I felt on a day-to-day basis uh, being surrounded by by people who wanted to hurt me because of the color of my skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the density the energy you feel when you're in those locations, the fear, um, sometimes the unknown and the real danger that you're feeling is when everything is compressed, you know. A lot of high-volume energies are put into a small space, and it just feels like a bug itself could go crazy in there. Do you know what I mean? It's just like it just is very difficult to find your way out of that or to find some space of sanity or quietness. Um, I think we find that when we step into a location or with a group of people or whatever it is, you're reading the frequency of that group. And pretty much Mm -hmm. you need to be in that frequency for safety, but then you also need to know how to transcend the frequency. Isn't that what your story is truly about? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it's a level of like, yes, we are we are spiritual beings, and we are still on this physical plane, right? So mm-hmm. there, again, there is a level of 
um, there's a level of beginning to understand that I am not um, I'm not these things that people continue to think that I am. Um, and then also, like, again, I'm a wounded healer. So it's not about escaping the wound. It's about embracing the wound, right? And so, you know, part of a much part of this a part of the story that I think is much different than sort of other spiritual books out there or there or whatever is that is that it's not a it's not a us versus them mentality. It's a right. we're all one mentality, including your very oppressors. And so so, you know, again what eventually happened is I began I was asked to study the law and essentially become the jailhouse lawyer for the prison. And there's only one and, and so I studied and studied and became essentially the advocate for, legally for the very men who were continually oppressing me. And so in that particular sort of set of parameters, it would be really easy to be like, no, I'm going to transcend this. And this is, you know, this is not an energy I want to be a part of. But again, my belief is that the universe always leads us into, into not only just the social justice realm, but a realm where we begin to embrace and hold the people who are trying to destroy us. Um, yeah. Because in that place is the deepest compassion and the deepest understanding that we are way more than just our sort of physical bodies that seem to be separation. Well, R.G., can you share with the listeners how you have taken your experiences now and you're helping others? Yeah, well, thank you for asking. I mean, uh, so my wife and I, we live in Oregon, and we have a, a nonprofit called Northwest Wisdom. And, uh, you know, I'm a certified spiritual counselor now and Reiki practitioner and energy healer, and my wife's a yoga, certified yoga instructor. And so part of what we're doing now is really creating a space for people to come and do the healing and address uh, address their own wounds in a safe space where they can come as they are. And again, we don't prescribe to any one particular religion, but we invite all, uh, regardless of where you come from, because that's how the healing happens. And so I do a lot of spiritual counseling. I do a lot of one-on-one, and I do group uh, meditation workshops. Um, I, I'm, really, I'm really now starting to shift into this space, space where I'm... Uh, I'm understanding my role is is to help lead others into in into the wound, so to speak, and and that can be a hard a hard position to be in. But I know that's what I'm called to do. Um, I also know that just as I'm called to do that, I knew that I was called to write this book because I do believe that the ocean inside me is um, it, it's speaking to something much larger than myself, and I think it's speaking to something that a lot of people are going through, especially in this. In this climate that we're that we're going through as a nation right now, and so again, um, you know, I'm I'm super grateful that the universe continues to work with me, and and you know, I'm super grateful to the listeners and to you, Doctor Jeanette, and I just continually ask for support, whether that's getting my book, The Ocean Inside Me, or helping with the nonprofit, or sharing, uh, you know, my story in any way possible. I'm just I'm just very grateful for that. Very good. Can you share with the listeners how to find out more information about you? Yeah, yeah. So our website is a nonprofit. So we're, you know, mm-hmm. we're a 5013C. Uh it's www.northwestwisdom.org. Um and then my book can be found either on the website or if you just go into Amazon uh, and just type in The Ocean Inside Me. Again, my name is RG Shore. That's just R period G and then Shore like the Ocean Shore, S H O R E. Mm-hmm. And you can just find it on Amazon or you can find it in your local bookstore. Um, again, just super grateful for the listeners and, and really excited for this this chapter in this season. It was such a pleasure to have you with us here today because I think um, many people will say, but I'm embarrassed. I carry a lot of shame and guilt about things that I've done in my life, the places I've been and the stories that I've interacted within. And what you're here to share today is that there is no shame and guilt. It is truly about being able to say, am I willing to step in and out of my life experiences to expand to be something more and to help others. And that's a perfect example of your story, yes? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I I mean, I think what I'm here, I think a part of my my story and a part of what I'm doing Mm -hmm. is saying whatever part of your story uh, that you're stuck on, 
uh, I'm, I'm here to show you, let's, let's look at the story from not only a different perspective, but let's zoom out. And so maybe like ending on analogy that I give my clients is really helpful is let's say we're baking cookies, right? And, it, and there's all these different ingredients that are in cookies, right? Flour, eggs, you know, salt, baking soda, et cetera. And, and a part of what I think a lot of your listeners who are struggling and a lot of everybody else that are struggling are doing is that they're focusing on just the baking soda. They're eating it and saying, your cookies taste awful. And it's like, well, yeah, of course they taste awful. You're just eating the baking soda. Let's mix all these ingredients together. Let's put it in the oven. Let's bake it and then tell yourself – and then take a bite and see how good your cookies are. Meaning, you're just focusing on the wound of yourself and you're focusing on the wound of others. But if you zoom all the way out, you start to see, oh, this tiny thing is just an ingredient in a much larger recipe that's going to make for a very tasty meal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, RG, it was a pleasure to have you with us to share yeah, today. I think your story is full of inspiration and we all... Just absolutely loved having you. Thank you so much. It was it was my my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Jeanette. Thank you. If you'd like to find out more information about the book, the book is called The Ocean Inside Me, a spiritual memoir on healing racial trauma by R.G. Shore. Please do click on the link on the bottom of today's show page to go directly to his website for more information. And it is about stopping for a minute and breathing and saying, am I experiencing life through my past experiences, my traumas and fears, or perhaps might I be willing to be able to say there's something more and guide me. That's truly where most people are these days is they're looking to become a seeker, to become someone who is asking questions, going out there and saying, I don't really know what this is, but I'm showing up and I'm present. Be out, be in your present moment, and take up the staff and really claim the place in which you are in. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Until tomorrow, have a great day. Today we discussed many life-changing concepts. Who do you turn to and how do you know what is best when faced with a health crisis? Dr. Jeanette is a patient advocate. She listens to the patient, the doctors, and the family, clarifies the health issues and concerns, then helps the patient make the best choices going forward. If you would like help implementing change into your life and health, we can talk and see where you are stuck and how to improve the quality of your life. Check the link on the bottom of today's show page or visit drjeanettegallagher.com to schedule a phone appointment today.